February 19th. Army camp near Vaucouleur. This morning I awoke to visions of fire and steel. These nightmares come more often, now that I've seen my beloved France eaten away by years of war. I wandered through camp, ignoring the new snowfall, but observing the wounds and weariness of every soldier under my command. Observing the desperation in their eyes. It was then that I first saw the girl. She told us that her name was Joan. She told us she was but a peasant who did not know how to ride or fight. She told us that she intended to rescue France. The darkness lifted from the men's souls. Her voice rang with conviction, and we drank in her every word. I may have lost my faith, but Joan has not lost hers, and that is enough for me. Joan has asked her ragged band of soldiers to take her to Chinon, where the rightful ruler of France, the Dauphin, hides from his foes. The war-torn land in between is infested with enemy marauders, and we will lose many men. Death is by now an old companion, but for Joan, we will face it again. As Joan's footsteps echoed down the marble hall of the chateau, the fat and whispering dukes did not but stare. The Dauphin himself seemed afraid as she kissed his feet. What gentle Dauphin, she demanded. Why does England claim what is ours? Why are you not crowned King of France, as is your right? The courtiers began to murmur. The Chamberlain whispered lies into the Dauphin's ear. But the Dauphin pushed the Chamberlain away and rose to meet Joan's gaze. She stands on me to the shoulder of the shortest man, but all of us must look up to speak to her. I know not what silent conversation passed between the Dauphin and his would-be savior. It was obvious that his majesty was in the same throne as we. March 26th, Chino. It is one thing for a band of dispirited soldiers to put their trust in a teenage girl. It is entirely another for that girl to be given command of the army of an entire nation. We were filled with pride when we heard the Dauphin's heralds pronounce Joan the Maid as commander of the army of France. So that she may look like a general, the Dauphin presented Joan with a great lance and a suit of white armor. Joan instructed me to look for an ancient sword buried beneath the altar of a local church. I was skeptical, but not only did the man unearth a rusted blade, but we found that the sword had belonged to Charlemagne, grandfather of France. I shall not doubt her word again. Still visible on the hilt was the fleur de lis. Joan adopted the fleur de lis as her symbol and had it blazoned upon her battle stand. Wherever Joan goes, the standard goes also. It goes with us to Orléans. The city of Orléans is one of the finest in France. But it is under siege by our enemies. England, Germany, is about to fall. This war has dragged on for one years, with precious few French victories. The people of Orléans need a savior. They will receive Joan of Arc. Joan prophesied that she would be wounded in Napoleon. In the height of the battle, nonetheless bolt knocked her from her horse. He could not believe our misfortune. But as we carried Joan away from the carnage, the battle was won. Orleon was free. When we entered the city, the entire population cheered us on from windows, rooftops, and city streets. They fired artillery into the night sky. Shouted aloud their nickname for Joan, La Pucelle, the Maid of Orléans. June 14th, Orléans. Our rescue of Orléans was a setback for our enemies, but only a minor one. The English still possess half of France. Tragically, we have cooled our heels for weeks while the Dauphin's advisors debate. Joan became irritated with the delay and reassembled her army. She talks of nothing but her mission to drive the English into the sea. The force of Joan's will is titanic. 
She has gathered to her banner swearing brigands and knaves and turned them into patriots and heroes. Among them is the man Laelia, a giant clad in plate mail. He drives men on with curses and fists. There will be plenty of English next for Laelia to bring in the day. Pate is the gateway to the Loire River Valley. The English hold the Loire in a grip of steel. Whilst the huge army and the surgeon Fastolf devastate the countryside. Joe leads us to Pate to capture the English castles. However, we must avoid Fastolf's army until we are strong enough to face his veterans. After Pate, the myth of English invulnerability was dispelled. Now, our army knows it is possible to win, but only if we are resolute and cunning. The English are a most deadly enemy. Their humble men have decimated the chain of attention as time and time again. To make matters worse, we now face enemies on both sides. The Dolphins advisor spent more and more time wrangling, jealous of Joan's influence and court. I pray that Joan can complete her divine mission before the Dolphin's envious advisors betray her. June 25th, Orléans. Dead France is returning to life. The army swells with human troops. In olden times, men swore fealty only to their particular lord. Now, we fight not for the insolent lords and ladies, but for France. For all of us, Joan is France. There is no distinction in our minds. The Dauphin himself has arrived in Orléans. Never have I seen such a celebration. France needs a king, so we must escort the Dauphin to Rennes, where he can be properly crowned. Yet, the city of Rennes is dangerously menaced by the Anglo Burgundian army. The cities of Troyes and Chalon also are the way. Joe commands that we must liberate all three cities before the coronation, and we eagerly seek to fight. As we rode into Reims, a sea of peasants and lords knelt before Joe. Some even knelt to kiss the horses of France. Cannon thundered, and a thousand flags danced in the breeze. In the enormous palace, the Dauphin knelt before the Archbishop and rose as King of France. Prayers, anthems, and sermons filled the great chateau. Interspersed among perfumed dukes and ladies were tattered soldiers from our army, many still bearing wounds. Joan herself was at the king's side, as was her bedraggled battle standard. Despite the celebration, I know in my heart that this war is far from over. Our fathers and grandfathers died fighting the English. June gives us hope. I do not know if hope is enough to ensure victory. September 3rd. France. France has a king once more. However, as Joan gains influence with the people, jealousy grows within the court. The king's evil advisors now seek to destroy Joan. It is only a matter of time before they succeed in poisoning the king's mind. Joan must hurry to fulfill her mission. Paris, the jewel of France, has been under English tyranny for decades, and French patriots trapped within the city are eager to escape. We are now marching on Paris, hoping that the reinforcements we have been promised will arrive in time. Tragedy. As the refugees fled into the chateau of Compiègne, was trapped outside. The Indian soldiers knocked her from her horse and paraded around with their prisoner. None of us can sleep knowing our precious Joan of Arc languishes in a Burgundian prison. The soldiers stare at the uncaring sky, condemning themselves for being unable to save her, for being unable to save France. Paris was the first major defeat ever dealt to our army. 
Had the king sent the promised reinforcements, we would have captured the city. Now it is Francis' darkest hour. July 14th, Bordeaux, new Joan of Arc. A rich world made empty and poor. The English put her on trial as a heretic. Joan's mind was as sharp as her sword, and she avoided all the cunning verbal traps of her prosecutors. In the end, Joan would not renounce her mission. The English found her guilty and burned her at the stake. But her death is not in vain. La Pucelle is the rallying cry, as peasant and nobleman alike take arms. My army is an army of the people. And even without the king, we are poised to strike at the English stronghold of Castillon. The victory at Castillon will crush the English pretensions in France forever. Should I die in this battle? I die for the maid of Orléans. I die as a patriot of France. A century of English toil, blood, and victories was reversed in a little over a year by a teenage girl. Years Even more importantly, Joan's acts ignited a sense of French nationalism. Peasants and nobles alike no longer belong to lords and kings, but to France herself. We will not let Joan be forgotten. Already, statues and stained glass portraits have been commissioned in hundreds of towns and cities throughout France. The verdict of guilt was rightfully reversed, and I expect that Joan of Arc will soon be beatified as a saint. Sometimes the outcome of history is determined by strength of arms, other times by happenstance. But in 15th century France, history was determined by the will of a young girl. The only person in history to command the armies of an entire nation at the age of 17.